Welcome to ARCA Treats Food for Thought, sponsored by Friends of the Alabama Archives. We are so happy that you're here today joining us for this special ARCA Treats program. And we would like for you to plan on visiting the table. If you didn't see it in the lobby, it's sponsored by the Friends of the Alabama Archives. They also sponsor the gift shop here. And there are books for sale there by uh, today's speaker. If you're interested in purchasing one of the books and having it signed by today's speaker, uh, you may want to do so and bring it to the stage after the program is over. She'll be here just for a few minutes after the program because she has to go to a meeting. So uh, if you're interested in purchasing one of her books, please do so. Also, we would like for you to plan to join us next month for the Year of Alabama History Architrix presentation on Thursday, April 16th, Mills Thornton's presentation of The Cotton State. I'm sure you will want to join us for that. We have some special guests today that we would like to welcome, representatives of the Porch Band of Creek Indians. I believe you're right here. Thank you for joining us. Also, there is a special event that's going on all week long. It's the Spring Fling, a special event for children who are on spring break this week. There have been events every day, and today, Architreats is part of their event. Following this, they will have an opportunity to explore the, uh, a tour of the Indian Gallery and make coil pottery. So I'd l I have a message for all participants in the Spring Fling. Please immediately after ARCA Treats ends, move to the second floor lobby. That's where the Indian tour begins. So uh, all Spring Fling participants, please move to the second floor lobby by 115. I hope everyone received one of these. Did you all receive? This is the outline inside. There is a program that has an outline of today's program and a bibliography. If you did not receive one and would like to have one, let me know after the program and I will be sure to get you one. Inside, there is a yellow sheet. Now, this is an audience evaluation form. Please fill this out and return this after the program to the volunteers that will be in the hallway. This program is sponsored by the Alabama Humanities Foundation and Friends of the Alabama Archives. So please uh, fill this out and return this to us. Remember, it's time to silence the cell phones or turn them off before the program begins. Today's speaker is professor of history at Auburn University and has authored or edited four books and numerous articles relating to Southeastern Indians. Please welcome Dr. Katherine Braun. Thank you, Sherry, and thanks to the friends of the Alabama Archives and the staff of the Archives for making these programs possible. It's always a treat to come to the place I consider to be the home of history in Alabama and to talk about the Creek Indians in Alabama. And um, Sherry, I believe, passed out a little piece of paper to you, and I'm here to plug a symposium we have coming up at the, uh, near the end of May in Auburn on the Creek War, uh, the uh, Creek War of 1813, and I hope you will uh, be able to come to that as well. And most of the details are there. I won't be talking very much about the Creek War today. You'll have to come to um, our symposium in May to hear about that. Well, my title today, The Creek Indians in Alabama, uh, was assigned to me when, when they were dividing up the, the year of Alabama history. And I, I thought about that and I thought, well, that's really a rather ironic play on words. Because by 1832, when the Creek Indians were indeed in the state of Alabama, encompassed by the state, the power of the Creek Nation had been effectively dismantled by a federal treaty that called for the allotment of Indian lands to individuals. So the ultimate result of this treaty was that after decades of diminish diminishment, the Creek Nation as a sovereign entity east of the Mississippi disappeared. So the Creek Nation subsumed by this new political and economic reality that was Alabama. So by becoming 
part of Alabama being in Alabama, the Creek people were essentially ejected from it. And I thought, well, that's a very bad place to start, isn't it? Uh, and the irony is really complete because the state takes its name from the Alabama tribe. The Alabama peoples were part of a multi-ethnic confederation of tribes whose territorial claims in the 18th century included most of the modern states of Georgia, Alabama, and even uh, by the end of the 18th century, Florida. The town of Wetumpka, an Alabama town, and you'd see it here on the uh, PowerPoint, if I can figure out how to uh, make my finger circle it, but you can see it there, uh, confirms the old adage about a picture being worth a thousand words. For here, really, this representation of political power among the Creek Indians, that council house, on a sacred square ground in a Creek town is now abandoned on this land plat, and it sits amid this township and range grid system which was imposed on Creek land by the state of Alabama in 1832 in this survey. Soon after that council house abandoned, disappeared, the Wetumpka people moved west, and Alabama grew. Now this knowledge sometimes makes us a little uneasy about our beginnings, this very fact that Alabama prospered at the expense of a people whose land was taken from them uh, is not something to take lightly. History teaches us many lessons, and this is one, sometimes might triumphs over justice. And so the end of the Indians in Alabama so to speak, comes in, 18, in the 1830s. But this afternoon, what I'd like to do is focus on the 18th and early 19th centuries, the period before removal when things were really different. And uh, when I talk about Creek history to my students, and in general, I like to look at um, three eras. And um, uh, I did have a slide that disappeared, but in any case, let's go on. And let me just talk tell you where I'm going with these three eras, and then I'll discuss them uh, one by one. The first of those three periods I like to call Creek Ascendancy. That's the period I really like, a period in the 18th century in which the Creek Confederacy experienced unparalleled growth as a result of their trade alliance with the British. The second I call Civilization and Defeat. This era focuses on the early years of the New Republic and goes through the Creek War. And the third era is Indian removal, the period after the Creek War in which the American government systematically, by treaty, managed to abrogate tribal land claims and in today's jargon to ethnically cleanse or attempt to do so the Southeast by transporting native peoples to Indian territory west of the Mississippi River. So that's where I want to go, a big broad survey of Creek history in the 18th and 19th centuries up through removal. And I thought I would start where I always like to start in a Creek town, um, and there you see two sketches by the naturalist William Bartram, who visited the Creeks in the late 18th century, and he left us uh, this elevation of a town square ground, you see, uh, the uh, cabins on a square ground, and then a layout of a Creek town where you see the central public <laughs> buildings and, and the uh, habitations uh, built all around the central public areas. Now the town was the central unit for the Creek Confederacy. Uh, the town unit, uh, you, can't get a, you can't talk about the Creeks without talking about their towns. The town, uh, each town had a very well organized local government and it was the focus of religious and ceremonial life for the people. Creek town sites were permanent and they were ancient. And these towns, by long tradition and a hardy defense, had established uh, hegemony over millions of acres in the South. Though the Creeks did not establish permanent settlements uh, outside uh, their territories, they did maintain active occupation of hunting grounds claimed by the towns. And uh, here you see an early 18th century hunting camp. These hunting camps they established on the territories outside towns. They built seasonal hunting shelters there. They maintained habitat outside their towns by burning to encourage game population. They established granaries for their hunters in these out areas so that in the winter when they were hunting, they would uh, be supplied with uh, dried corn. They identified and frequented clay pits, salt licks, and mineral deposits in the areas outside their towns. And most importantly for early settlers, they left a network of trails all across the southeast. They left canoes and rafts at favored river crossings and throughout the year when they weren't in their towns engaging in agriculture, they were in the forest gathering uh, wild produce and game animals. 
By the late historic era, there were 60 major creek towns, and they were divided uh, into two geopolitical divisions that most of us have heard of frequently, the upper and lower towns. Uh, creeks lived here for most of the year and cultivated large fields of corn and other crops. They were expert horticulturalists. And if you uh, can, can see from the map, uh, the upper creeks on the Coosa and uh, Tallapoosa and Alabama rivers are right in the heart of what is now Alabama. And these upper towns territory extended all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and to the north into the Tennessee Valley. So encompassing most of the state, those lower creeks, as you see there on the Chattahoochee River, uh, claimed land all the way uh, practically to the Atlantic Ocean. And the western boundary for the Creek Nation, for those of you who are interested, was the Tom Bigby River in the west of the state. That was the boundary between Creek Indian and Choctaw Territory. Uh, Creek power in the southeast was based on a longstanding, uh, and here again, uh, another map to show you in perspective the entire southeast. Now let me see if I can work how to do this uh, to highlight. Uh, these boundaries uh, were pretty extensive all around the southeast and up through there. So creek, the creeks were more than in Alabama. They owned what is Alabama, Georgia, and most of Florida. Creek power was based on a long trading affiliation and military alliance with the British. The fruits of that alliance uh, was evident at the Congress of Piccolotta, a meeting with the British held near St. Augustine in 1765, which you see here uh, represented on a, uh, an engraved powder horn. Uh, here, the British Superintendent of Indian Affairs, the royal official, and the Governor of East Florida, who is the individual in the middle there, is uh, smoking a peace pipe with two Creek Indian chiefs from the Chattahoochee town of Co towns of Coweta and Casita. And the British in that treaty recognized the Creek Indians as the rightful owners of the entire uh, Florida Peninsula, as they put it in the treaty by right of conquest. Now, this alliance with the British colonies, first forged in 1685, resulted in a frequently turbulent but nonetheless profitable partnership. The Creek uh, predilection for the British is simple to understand. As one South Carolinian quipped early in the 18th century, they affect them most who sell best cheap. And isn't that still true today? Uh, if you want a consumer to come and see you, get the best quality merchandise, sell it at a good price, and that's what the British did. They had high quality goods specifically designed for the Indian market. They made the best price, sold it at the best price, and their British Navy ensured that there was a steady supply of trade goods. And here again, the Alabama play a role in this. And you can see this French fort there at the junction of the, the Mobile River. Uh, that's actually the Alabama River dividing into the, the uh, uh, Coosa and Tallapoosa. Uh, the Alabama Indians uh, invited the French to build a fort among them as a counterweight to English ambitions and to keep the English traders honest. It was a perpetual thorn in the British colonial side uh, but it was merely an irritant, not steady competition, for the British organization of the trade, these private traders loaded down with a steady supply of desirable goods, always managed to uh, outmatch the best efforts of the French. And so the Creeks became commercial hunters, supplying the British with deerskins for a growing European market. In return, they obtained guns, cloth, tools, and ornaments. The dramatic transformation wrought by European technology is beautifully illustrated in this early 18th century watercolor detailing the transformation of a hunter with his handmade weapons and clothing on, the, uh, on your left side uh, to a commercial hunter complete with musket and manufactured cloth clothing uh, in the middle. And what's so interesting in particular about this is you see those blue strad leggings but the duffel blanket is decorated in much the same way the traditional bison robe would have been. So the British uh, were very sensitive to the demands of consumers as far as colors and patterns and design. And by the uh, very early in the 18th century, every one of those Creek towns had a resident British trader, sometimes more than one. And it was through this access to British goods and guns that the Creeks became powerful and wealthy in the 18th century. And time is short, so I have to say it was a fleeting prosperity, as Americans are all too familiar with perhaps today. 
for the trade made them debtors ultimately and left them dependent on others for the source of their power. As commercial hunters, the Cretes needed more and more hunting land because they were beginning to deplete their deer herds by overhunting. And one of the first places they turned their attention to was the Florida Peninsula, another source well, which had been early, uh, late in the 17th century and early in the 18th century, another valuable commodity that the British liked, and that was Indian slaves. So the first seeking slaves, that ends, and they began to hunt for deer. The Creeks became really expanding imperialist in a great age of expansionist and imperialist. By 1763, the Creeks had built new settlements in north central Florida. And here on the map, you probably can't see it, uh, but Tallahassee, uh, Florida's modern capital, appears here near the ruins of uh, uh, the Spanish mission San Luis, destroyed by the Creeks, armed with British muskets early in the 18th century. And by uh, the middle of the 18th century, they were building new Creek towns there. There were other settlements on the Suwannee River and around the Alachua Savannah near modern Gainesville. Creeks were there too. Their southernmost settlement, New Eufaula, a name that's familiar to Alabamians, sat astride the 28th parallel of latitude, not far from modern Tampa, Florida. And these new settlements eventually came, became the backbone of a third very important division of the Creek Confederacy, the Seminoles. In effect, the, British had, the, the Creeks had become partners with the British in the conquest and colonization of Florida. And Florida was not the only geographic expansion uh, uh, area of expansion for Creek towns. To the northeast, the, there were wars between the Lower Creeks and the Cherokees, and uh, those wars ended in Creek favor. The Cherokees retreated, and the Creeks laid claim to lands all along the Savannah River, the boundary uh, between modern Georgia and South Carolina. And in the West, a series of bloody and prolonged conflicts with the Choctaw were centered over control of the Escambia Basin and the lands along the Tom Bigby River. This woodcut, or these woodcuts, I should say, uh, reproducing, uh, one reproduces a quick pictograph of a battle scene with a Choctaw, illustrates only one minor battle from the war, which raged over a decade. And here you see the successful Creeks encountering a party of four Choctaw Indians. This was actually uh, painted on a deer skin and then purchased by, uh, in this case, Bernard Romans, who had it engraved and included in his book. So this is a startling fact, that the Creek people were actively expanding and actually conquering and colonizing new areas. That's sort of a new view of, of Native American peoples for most of us. And these were heady days indeed for the Creeks and also for their uh, trade partners because merchants in Georgia and South Carolina and the Floridas grew rich on the proceeds of a profitable trade in native deer skins that was both the impetus and the result of Creek expansion. In fact, Deerskin trade early on was the economic mainstay of the southernmost colonies until they found other goods from which to prosper. And although the southeastern tribes were commercial hunters, perhaps no group was more successful at exploiting the opportunity or profited quite as much as did the Creeks. And that leads me to the broad, to the, uh, from the broad in general to the individual. And there is one individual whose life, I think, really mirrors this alliance to the British and what it meant. And it was an old man that the traveling naturalist William Bartram met when he visited the Creek towns in the 1770s. Uh, uh, Bartram came into the town of Mucolosis, and he met an old man being led to a place of honor by three young men. Bartram wrote in his book that this old man was stone blind by extreme age and what hair he had left was white as snow. He was the most ancient chief of the town, Bartram wrote, and when Bartram honored him with a gift, the old chief returned the favor and began to make a long oration, the purpose of which was the value he set on the friendship of the British colonies. Bartram recorded that this chief told the assembly that when he was a young man, they had no iron hatchets, pots, hoes, knives, razors, nor guns, but they made those they used, they, they made their own stone axes, clay pots, flint knives, bows, and arrows, and that he was the first man who brought the white people's goods into his town. And he did this on his back from Charleston, 500 miles on foot 
for they had no horses then among them. Well, the Creeks soon got horses and they soon established a regular uh, uh, correspondence with the English and that trade alliance was very important and remained important to them. And if you go into the gallery upstairs, you will see many of the kinds of goods that we're talking about that were so highly valued, including uh, metal goods, pots and so forth, uh, everyday implements, even including forks, which testifies to the, the change and even eating habits brought by this new technology, and things like beads and uh, silver, personal adornment, which uh, because of the tyranny of preservation, those are the kinds of things that get left behind, not the textiles. Now the old chief didn't mention textiles, cloth, uh, but th those were certainly included in his backpack and they were the real mainstay of the trade. And they are often, these simple things like duffels and strouds are often overshadowed by these kinds of luxury goods, the trade beads and the silver. But these uh, testify to the personal wealth of successful Creek hunters and in a culture where wealth is not measured in land, but in personal possessions, and when adornment was the mark of high status, the new material goods created new means of artistic self-expression for 18th century Creeks. And um, you see uh, the development throughout the 18th century. I wish I could do my whole talk on this, this beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, fashion that became Creek fashion in the 18th century with all these imported cloths and goods. And um, here you see even up to an imported uh, peacock feather. I think you can see that up there. Um, but markets are fickle and times change and Creek dependence on the traders for their clothing and their weapons eventually became not a source of strength but a source of weakness. In fact, the crash came fairly quickly and coincided with the American Revolution. The Creeks themselves in that war divided over the best course of action, and as the famous Creek Alexander McGillivray noted, the Creeks liked to have made a war among themselves the same way the colonists and the British did. Some Creeks were loyal to the British and what that alliance represented, which was trade and prosperity, and most especially it, was, it represented peace and order. There, they were suspicious of the lawless frontier dwellers on Georgia, and, and very good reason to be so, because Americans might talk of liberty and freedom, but in the Georgia backcountry, those high ideals meant the liberty from British regulations and the freedom to encroach on Indian land. However, some Creeks were influenced by decades of friendship with their Georgia and South Carolina traders, and they trusted them, and they sought neutrality and tried to keep the Creeks out of the revolution. And by the skin of their teeth, the Creek people managed to avoid their own civil war, but the American Revolution changed the course of Creek history and ended a centuries-old trading alliance with the British. Now, extreme, extremely complex economic factors were at work, but there are two main reasons for this. One is uh, a drop in the demand for deerskins, a plain economic reason. And the second, and probably the most important, was the rising importance of new economic endeavors by Anglo-Americans, particularly uh, commercial farming, including cotton production, ranching, and timbering. And added to this was a growing racial bias against Indians. In short, to many 19th century Americans, Indians were culturally and racially different therefore inferior, and seemingly they were a major obstacle to American expansion and thus a threat to American security and prosperity, and that was the view of many people on the frontier. Now such perceptions by Anglo-Americans called for a solution. Uh, outright extermination was ruled out by uh, most everyone. There were a few who, who thought that was a good idea. But the more charitable view tended not toward acceptance and peaceful coexistence or, and multiculturalism, but for a radical change, and that radical change would have to be on the part of Native Americans. And thus we come to the second uh, great period in Creek history that I like to talk about, and that is the period in which the American government tried to remake Indians into culturally indistinct people through the auspices of the unfortunately named Civilization Program, the Great Civilization Program. Now for the Creeks, the program's first thrust came in 1790, which is when this sketch was made of this Kusada chief. And uh, in 1790, a large delegation of Creek headmen representing every part of the Confederacy 
traveled to New York City to negotiate with President George Washington. And I might say as an aside that this was the first treaty under the new Constitution, so it's very important historically, the Treaty of New York that resulted. Now, under the terms of the Treaty of New York, the government, the United States government, promised a number of things. One was to, to defend Creek property. They were looking for an established boundary which the United States would respect, and at that time, the government promised to do that. They also promised economic aid to the Creek people in the form of domestic animals and implements of husbandry. And the idea was to transform the Creek economy from depending on commercial hunting and move it toward commercial agriculture. Now, the idea that they would teach Creeks to farm is ludicrous because they already knew how to do that. The problem was they weren't farming the right things and marketing it uh, for profit. And the civilization program went further than mere economic reforms because the idea became to transform the way Creeks uh, uh, viewed land ownership from tribal land ownership to individual ownership of land, also the way they reckoned kinship uh, through a mat from a matrilineal system in which descent is traced through the female line to the more uh, natural to Anglo-American patrilineal way of uh, counting uh, kinship and reckoning who the head of the family is and it also would provide a means then to pass along private property, particularly land. And also in all this is the idea that this would be a way to undermine tribal authority. In other words, to destroy the power of Indian governments and to incorporate Indian peoples who would be just like other Americans into the larger society. Um, it was also uh, understood in all this that this would be a really good way to acquire Indian land because, as Thomas Jefferson himself would later note, uh, Farmers don't need as much land as hunters, and the United States government, I'm sorry to say, also worked to increase creek debt so they could then turn around and uh, ask for land sessions as payment for those debts to the government. So it, it, was, a, it was a program uh, not only to transform the creeks, but to reduce their <coughs> land holdings. And as government policymakers foresaw, private lands are easier to acquire from individual Indians by sale than it is to collectively uh, obtain large <coughs> parcels of land by treaty. Um, Christianity was part of it too, and Christian Indians would be expected to abandon their ancient ceremonies, their religions, their belief about the world and how it was made and the place of their people in it. They would, in fact, abandon their towns and live apart in small families in much the same way as other Americans. As one scholar of the period has written, acceptance of the civilization program for an Indian meant change of the most fundamental elements of culture, a change in the way you're, you believe, a change in your subsistence patterns, in settlement patterns, in family organization, and the very ways women and men define their genders and roles and their responsibilities to themselves, their kin, and their communities. It was, in effect, she has written, life-taking. Now, America's policy was largely entrusted to Benjamin Hawkins, who is widely credited as being the first agricultural extension agent in, in the South, <laughs> as a sort. Uh, and he is the one who uh, was charged with transforming Creek and Cherokee and Chickasaw and Choctaw uh, economies into commercial agriculture. Uh, but what happened in all of this, which is very complex, is that all this reordering of the Creek world resulted in uh, divisions and, in fact, uh, even economic chaos. Town governments were, uh, some of their traditional powers were overturned by political reforms, and with American settlers closing in on all sides and encroaching on Indian lands, with families threatened by this all-out assault on traditional values, the creeks uh, imploded. Now, this afternoon, I do not have a time, do not have the time uh, to relate the complex causes or the awful consequences of the war that erupted in 1813 among the creeks, but it was largely as a result of the pressures brought on by the civilization program. Uh, towns were burned, there were bloody battles, there were five armies that marched toward the creek towns. From the north came Andrew Jackson and his Tennessee volunteers, from the Mississippi Territory came uh, General Claiborne, accompanied by Pushmataha and Choctaw warriors. Uh, 
ready to redress old grudges against the Creek people from the 18th century wars. General Floyd marched from Georgia, the Cherokee still smarting at the loss of some of their lands and eager to show their alliance to the American government joined in as well. Uh, to the Creeks at places like Holy Ground, Hillaby, Atassi, and Tahopica, it must have seemed like the end of the world as towns were burned, livestock and crops destroyed, many of them by elements of the uh, insurgent Creeks fighting against the National Council, and as people were slain or driven into exile in Florida. By the time Creek Chief William Weatherford famously surrendered to Andrew Jackson at the ruins of the old French Fort Toulouse, most of the Creek towns were charred ruins and an estimated 3,000 Creek people were dead. For the rest of the hungry homeless people, there was only, as one contemporary wrote, wretchedness, devastation, and ruin. The final insult, the loss without payment of 20 million acres of land, which was the largest land session ever made in the South to that time. Uh, what to do? The survivors did the only thing possible. They regrouped in their shrunken domain, rebuilt their towns, and attempted to rebuild their lives. And I might add, there's a terrible hungry period after the war in which people uh, have difficulty in getting crops planted and food. So the death toll, uh, it really uh, rises. And uh, here you see on this map this very large session, uh, leaving only uh, this area uh, of creek lands uh, left after the war. So. After the war, the British defeated in Spain at bay, the tide of American immigration into the region heightened. Pressure on remaining creek land became even more intense, and with the obvious failure of the civilization program, Americans turned to a new idea, the physical removal of the Indians from lands coveted by Americans. If you can't incorporate them, then the next thing is to remove them. And removal proved to be uh, the ultimate land grab. There's no way around it. Humanitarians could point out, and did, that if removed beyond the Mississippi River, at least the Indians could be protected from abuse, live in the manner of their ancestors, and gradually become incorporated into the American system. I think their arguments speak of the failure of will of, of government at both the state and national levels to uphold basic treaty laws as well as the law of the land, but it also uh, speaks to the failure of humanitarianism, for in many ways the Creeks, like all the other southeastern tribes, were civilized by the American plan, uh, so much so that they proudly refer to themselves to this day as the five civilized tribes. Many had already adopted a cash crop agriculture and even acquired African slaves. And if you're going to talk about the height of civilization in the uh, beginning of the old South Cotton State, then that smacks of it. A plantation house with slaves means you are uh, quite like everyone else, or maybe even uh, more wealthy than most of the people around you. Many of the Indians had acquired Christianity and under the tutelage of missionaries had learned to read the Bible better than some of their white neighbors. But they still own the land and, and Americans resented the power of Indian governments over such large territories. Minnewa of Okfusky's life story personifies all three uh, epochs of Creek history to me. He, he was born at the very end of the period of Creek ascendancy. He was the son of a deerskin trader. He became, or was reputed to be, one of the wealthiest men in the Upper Creek towns before the Creek War. He lost all his property in the Creek War and distinguished himself by his conduct at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. He was the war leader for the Okfusky towns, uh, and most all of them were wiped out in that battle. Uh, and he, uh, horribly wounded and left for dead, uh, along with a handful of other Creek warriors, managed to escape by cover of darkness after the battle. As one of the few men of his generation to survive the battlefield, he became the leader of the Okfusky people in the post-war years. He was an ardent spokesman for peace after the war, recognizing the impossibility of defeating the U.S. militarily. But he was still a warrior, and in 1825, he was called upon by the Creek National Council to lead Creek lawmenders, as their uh, police force was called, to execute another Creek chief for treason. That man was William McIntosh, and a man who had served with the Americans in the Creek War. Uh, the treason was the unauthorized sale of Creek land east of, the east of the Chattahoochee River to Georgia without the consent of the Creek government. And I might also add a good part of land uh, west of the Chattahoochee River too. McIntosh knew he was breaking Creek law and he hoped to personally profit from it. 
He paid a high price because Creeks united against his treason and uh, demanded that he pay the full price of the law. He knew what the law was. Uh, with the lawbreaker executed, Minnewa joined the prestigious delegation of Creek headmen who traveled to Washington, D.C. in 1825. These Creeks, most of whom had fought against Minnewa, who was a red stick in the Creek War, uh, met with the United States president in an attempt to save their Georgia land. They were successful in having the McIntosh Treaty overturned because even the United States government, and it was a ratified treaty, recognized that it had really uh, not been a legitimate treaty. But they couldn't get the United States to ameliorate the terms. Uh, they did retain their Alabama land, uh, so somewhat less than what McIntosh had sold. Uh, but basically, by the end of that, all they had left was their Alabama land. And you can ponder these maps as I continue uh, going on, but you can see the successive treaties. And on the, uh, on the left, uh, my right, you can see what land remains in Alabama. The Creeks understood the game was nearly up, and Americans were putting tremendous pressure on Indians to leave their lands and move west. And in fact, in, by this 1825 treaty, they had land in the west uh, in exchange for the land they lost in Georgia. And in the end, the Creek people did something uh, very interesting. They committed the equivalent of political suicide to save their land in Alabama. In the Creek Removal Treaty, the 1832 treaty, they dissolved the communal land rights of the Creek Nation and allotted or distributed a fraction of tribal lands to individual heads, Creek heads of households. And the idea was they give up their tribal lands, but individuals can own their land and hold on to it. And that was the hope, anything to retain their land. It should have worked. It would have worked if the world were run by angels. But the world is full of men and greedy men who cheat, cheated, beat, stole, hounded, and harassed the new Creek landowners until a group of Creek warriors rose up in resistance, the Creek War of 1836. The state of Alabama turned a blind eye to the injustice and profited from it, and the Indian fields, here you see the map, soon became cotton fields, and you can see two of them uh, here in this uh, plat map. The United States government saw the Creek War of 1836 as a reason to forcibly evict all the Creek people from Alabama, hostile or not. Removal was a brutal process. Though some saw the handwriting on the wall and went willingly in the decades before the treaty, others traveled west under armed guards who served both to force them from their homes and protect them from white Alabamians. For the Creeks, the losses were staggering, for in addition to losing land and personal property of uncalculated value, large numbers died either during or just after removal due, due to accidents, hunger, exposure, exhaustion, or the cu cumulative effect that such insults uh, offer to the human spirit. Removal remains, I think, one of the most shameful moments in American history, and it is closely tied to the extent expansion of the plantation south and the expansion of racial slavery. Minowa saw all this too. At the time of the 1836 war, he was again a soldier, but this time he was a member of American military forces seeking to pacify Seminole Indians, some of whom, like the great Seminole chief Osceola, had actually been born in what is now Alabama. These were refugees from the Creek War, refugees who refused to surrender and refused to trust the United States. Minowa's actions are hard for some to understand. Why would he fight against his people wearing an American army uniform against you know, the, the, arm, the uniform of his enemy? And I think the reason is clear. His actions speak of loyalty to the peace treaty and trust to the United States government that it would honor its pledge that those who fought under its flag would be exempt from removal and allowed to keep their lands. Minowa returned from Florida to find his town abandoned, his family gone, the promise broken. For me, his experience is especially poignant. Here is a man who did everything his culture and community demanded of him with honor and valor. He upheld the finest traditions of his people. He never flinched from doing his duty. And yet, ironically, he lost his battles and he lost his land. But Manawa was not a loser. By fulfilling the Creek ideals of manhood and leadership, he has achieved a lasting place in not only Creek history, but Alabama and American history as well. And so his story, like that of his people, isn't a story of losers and loss. It is a hard story. It is a complex one. In the end, 
we can say that Creek history is a story of a proud and powerful people who were conquered but not defeated, who lost their land but not themselves, for the Creek people survived it all. Indian removal drove the Creek Indians from the lands of their ancestors, and Creek men and women rebuilt their towns and societies in a new and hostile environment in the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. And I think their success says much about the ability of a strong people to overcome adversity, which is another lesson we can learn from history. Defeat and dispersal could not, did not, destroy them. In Alabama, the 20th century saw another Creek struggle, the fight by Fort Porch Creeks to achieve federal recognition. Like scores of Alabamians of Creek ancestry, the ancestors of the Porch community managed to escape removal and remained on their small property holdings in South Alabama. What set the Porch Band apart from others of Indian ancestry was their continuing sense of community as an Indian people, their acknowledgement that they were Indians. It wasn't easy or popular to claim Indian descent in the 19th or 20th century in Alabama, but the Porch Creeks never lost their sense of themselves. Neither time nor adversity could subvert it. Indeed, it is almost a miracle and certainly a testament to the strength of their culture and will that the Porch Creeks have managed to remain Indians in Alabama. And fortunately, there are others of Indian ancestry in Alabama, and I think our state is richer for it. And I wonder uh, what our history could have been had we all, our ancestors, made a few different decisions along the way. Uh, but we can certainly uh, thank the Indian background in Alabama, not only for the name of our state, but many continuing traditions that we all share from foodways to the beautiful names that uh, are, uh, grace our states, rivers, and towns, uh, and also many of our cultural traditions which we can trace to uh, Indian origins. And I thank you for your attention. We will now take questions from the audience. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We will give you a microphone and hold it to your mouth so that we can, everyone can hear. What were the earliest dates of, of the Creek Indians in Alabama? Go, go back a little earlier than the 18th century. The question is, what were the earliest dates of the Creek Indians in Alabama? Now that uh, is, is a very sort of Western question, uh, a, a European kind of question to ask. And it, I'll give you a, an Indian answer. Um, <laughs> in the beginning, the people came from the earth and spread out on it. And as far as the Creek towns, they fought fog and, and uh, other adversities. And they came to a place and made it a and, and recognized it as a sacred place and made it a home. Now I realize that, and I'm, that's, a, that's a very uh, uh, quick encapsulation of Creek Indian origin myth. And I realize that's not the question you wanted uh, me to uh, that's not the answer you wanted for your question. The answer is the Creek people uh, began to uh, be here a very, very long time ago, and we culturally can trace their ancestors to the Mississippians who were here before. The town layout and so forth is very much like the town layouts we see in Mississippian sites. Uh, there is in-migration by various peoples, but they were here a very, very long time. And in the uh, wake of the early explorers, notably to Soto, when those early Mississippian, we believe they were uh, organized a little different politically, caused such disruption. Some Indians moved down, some moved out, but basically they were here uh, in, the, in the 16th century to greet De Soto, and their ancestors had been here much longer than that. So a long time. Yes. I wonder if you can tell me uh, what's being done as far as preservation of the council area at Tallahassee. I'm afraid I, I can't uh, address that. I have no personal knowledge of that. There is a council tree there on, on Auburn land, on Agra land. I think someone else in the audience is willing to address that. No, no. <laughs> Perhaps someone who, who is here might be able to answer your question, but, but I, don't, uh, I don't have the, the answer to that.
surely there's an archaeologist somewhere who can answer that. I'm curious, in the early Creek towns, what was the role of the women, both in the homes and in the government of the town? Uh, the question is, what was the role of women in the Creek towns? Well, uh, their, their role was very important. They're, they're very important economically. And Creek society was organized through matrilineal, matrilineally. Uh, kinship passed through the female line. And some people think that means, that, well, did women rule? Uh, no, they did not. Uh, but women were very important as far as government in that Creek women very seldom let uh, their opinion, kept their opinions to themselves. And they were, they were known uh, to let their husbands and particularly their brothers and their uh, uh, uncles know their views. And particularly in the 18th century when, when European traders came into Creek towns and began intermarrying with the Creeks, they always chose women who were fairly high placed. In other words, the sister of the chief of the town. And so that gave that woman a lot of clout because many Creek women became these sort of cultural intermediaries. They're the ones who teach the foreigners the language. They teach them the culture ways. Uh, they pass on government news back and forth and that sort of thing. So unofficially, they have a great deal of clout. That's hard to measure, but we know it was there. Economically, they are essential, not only in the subsistence economy of corn production and household manufacture, all the clothing, all the household utensils, everything but the, the architecture, uh, basically, and war implements are made by women. But in the deerskin trade, they become very important. And that, uh, that earlier slide of the hunting camp, and I'll just flip back to that, uh, what you see are, aren't men at the hunting camp. They're off actually trying to find the deer. It's the women who are there. And the uh, women process the hides for, uh, for export half-dressed the hides, and their labor contributed substantially to the, the uh, gross national uh, product of the Creek Nation, as it were, during that period. So women are very, very important, and you can see, it, maybe uh, the lights are uh, on, but you can probably still see, she's wearing a red stroud skirt, so we know that's a woman, and you see their kettles, but they're, they're busy uh, in this uh, fairly hostile environment of a hunting camp processing literally hundreds of pounds of deer skin. So very important in that, that exchange. When, when the uh, Creek Nation was at its uh, peak, what do we think the population was? Well, there, we, we, we don't know. It's hard, it's hard to say because Europeans were interested in counting uh, Indians, but they counted gunmen. And a gunman is anyone from age about 16 on up into 50s or 60s who could, carries a gun. And they, they're counting gunmen for two reasons. They need to be able to uh, understand how many hunters there are for economic reasons and also how many warriors there are in case times get tough. And so Europeans were fairly accurate, the British were, in counting warriors. They didn't bother to count other people. So how many other people are there? How many women, children, how many of the elderly are there? And some conservative uh, thinkers take a figure of four or five and multiply the gunman. And when you do that, you end up with about 20,000 people. Uh, but the, on the other hand, we know that the, the people with the highest death rate in the 18th century are gunmen for a variety of reasons, not the least of which, you know, they're shooting each, each other. And so I think, uh, particularly in some periods, the ratio is much higher. But let's just say 20 to 25,000, and th that would be a top estimate. And you think, well, that doesn't sound like very many people. But consider this. Up until the time of the American Revolution, there were more Creek Indians than there were Georgians and Floridian black and white. So and it's after the, and that's the, I didn't mention in my talk, but that's the other thing that shifts uh, out of favor for the Creek Indians. They are uh, welcoming new towns. They are welcoming new people. Their population is one of the few Indian populations in the southeast that actually seems to grow in the 18th century. It doesn't matter. After the American Revolution, the population of Georgia, black and white, begins to explode, and pretty soon they are a minority in the southeast. 
the Americans are going to outnumber them. And that's really, it's really a numbers game after that. How can these few people hold this large area of land against the, the greater numbers? So I'm glad you asked that question. So, yes. Uh, I was able to get my certificate of degree of Indian blood in Oklahoma where I was born, Choctaw, because my grandmother was on the Indian roll. When did the U.S. government begin Indian rolls? And isn't there um, an excellent library in Birmingham that has Indian census in it? Um, or is that just something I came across in my reading that's a mistake? I, uh, the, the question is about Indian roles. I'm not exactly sure the date of the, the enrollment procedure by the federal government. There are a number of different times they do it. And uh, it's, it's a process that is fraught with, with some difficulty because the American government was interested in the Indian head of family and, again, patrilineal descent. And so uh, you have some traditional Indians who favored matrilineal descent, who didn't trust the government, who did not sign the rolls. And you have others who, 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 uh, people who did. So it varies from tribe to tribe. As for, I'll put a plug in for the archives. As far as people who are trying to do research on Indian ancestry, a really good place to start is right here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History because they have access to online searches through Ancestry.com. I believe you also have uh, quite a few other resources. But in any case, uh, there is an expert on staff here who can help people and, and help you go other places. And then obviously, if you're looking for Choctaw or Creek or whatever, to contact the tribes to see about that. So, and and I, I, I don't really know that process. Yes. We have time for one more question. Do we have one more? You asked for an archaeologist? Yes, there you go. <laughs> she can tell you the answer to the question. Um, I can answer the, the, I think I can answer it. Who asked the question about Tallahassee? Are you talking about the Council Oak at Tuckabachi? Okay, well, the town of Tallahassee was, unfortunately, before the Alabama Burial Act, was rented by a looter, and the soil was stripped back and the graves were looted. Um, but the town of Tuckabachi is owned by a landowner. It's in private hands, but it's, uh, he's a very good steward, and he was actually active in getting the Alabama Burial Act passed. So I don't think the Council Oak still stands, but I was out there recently, and there has been no looting or of any kind. So um, they're very good landowners. They're very conscious of protecting the site, and. I think you've even been out to Oklahoma to learn more about its significance. Thanks, Stacy. <laughs> Thank more. you, Dr. Braun. And uh, if you have a book that you would like for Dr. Braun to sign, she will be here just for a few minutes. If you uh, have questions for her, you can speak to her for a few minutes at the stage. Thank you so much for coming.